Hello fellow YouTubers and welcome to the party. Today we will seek to understand how numbering systems evolved. So as we begin our journey we will look at the following introduction. We will look at a civilization and its properties, what those are about and how they are formed. We will look at the concept of one. We are going to have a brief look at the Shango burn. We are going to look at Egyptian hieroglyphics and systems. Sumerian and Babylonian numbering as well will be covered here. Greek numbering, Roman numbering and also we will be looking at Hindu Arabic influences. So the origins of numbering and counting can be quite controversial as the history of these systems are extremely old. And so to a degree there is a level of uncertainty as to who made what. This as many people claim to be the main contributors for mathematics and numbering systems and this includes various different cultures, ethnic groups, minorities, majorities and civilizations. Adding to the complexity is that humans can at times reinvent knowledge and systems that have been discarded or lost over time, only to find evidence many years later that it once did actually exist, and so blurring the line between the inventor and the reinventor. Though it's somewhat of a mystery as to the exact origins of numbers, we have found evidence across the ages of various different civilizations using systems of counting, some of these in more simplified forms than others. The trick is to be careful before pointing a finger at one specific tribe, country or group and say, you did it. Uh, this can be very relative. People move from region to region, often changing their names, their cultural identities as they move and this can be forced upon them through captivity, conquest and war. But this can also be done through things like migration or it can be done through influence from other tribes. So for example two tribes merging as one. So as far as we know of there are at least six cradles of civilization that scholars believe to have evolved and developed independently of each other. These are namely Egypt, Mesopotamia, which is also what we would call a modern day Iraq and Iran, the Indus Valley, present day Pakistan, and Afghanistan, China, Mexico and Peru. All of these had their own numbering systems as well as different forms of mathematics, alphabetical characters and systems to which they would be able to perform things like for example commerce. So the concept of one has been invented across many different tribes and civilizations over history, though admittedly with different names and different purposes. These many cultures either evolved this further or it remained basic in use and so in other words some became tallies while others became fully fledged numbering systems with bases and mathematics. Some tribes and cultures drew lines in the sand, others would inscribe their own bone, stick and rocks, sometimes even weapons as tally marks, while other groups would group them into sections to provide and form the basis for some sort of new numbering system. It's generally argued that counting and tallies began with fingers and this potentially explains why so many numbering systems seem to be base 10 digits. Some cultures counted on fingers on one hand while others counted on both, some counted up the arm while others counted the various segments between the knuckles on each finger, so variations of finger counting did exist. So an interesting piece of history was found in the Congo in Africa that seems to be of some interest to scientists and archaeologists. The Ashanga bone, two have been found apparently, show lines in a bone that seem to be patterns and there are seem to be sections associated with these lines as well and there seems to be some sort of speculation on what this tool might have been used for. Some say they are tally bones, others say they are numbering systems, possibly base 10. No one really truly knows, but many have guessed as to their overall purpose. Apart from the bone, the people who used them did not provide much in the way of inscription or documentation, but the groupings do seem to have patterns and this of course makes things interesting. The notches on one bone seem to have different sections, one could be for a base 10 numbering system or potentially for prime numbers and a third section is also unknown. One theory is they may relate to things like moon phases. There are different articles that marry each other on the innovation and purpose and the overall invention of this bone 
for this artifact. But again, nothing's really clear. There's no added research or anything like that. So I feel unfortunately there seems to be quite a lot of guesswork involved in what is currently an interesting artifact. So the Egyptians have always been a fascinating study and in many ways great preservers of much of their ancient history. We cover this contribution to the alphabet in another video, but they seem to have made enormous significance impact to various different other neighboring systems as well, in these relating to things like mathematics and the sciences. They have built incredible structures that have lasted and they've also contributed towards the history that has allowed us to make some very important discoveries. One of these is a base 10 numbering system and this was preserved in glyphs. The glyph numbering system is probably one of the oldest numbering systems to date. So the first thing to note about this numbering system is that we have a vertical rod which rep represents a one. So one up to nine would be represented by vertical rods. Then what we have is we have the heel bone. A heel bone is represented by a 10. So in other words, after nine rods, we would normally then have a heel bone. We have a coil of rope which represents 100. The lotus flower represents 1,000. The finger represents 10,000. The bird, frog, some say a tadpole or fish, represents 100,000. And then the final character is a kneeling person and that represents 1 million. If we wanted to represent the number 150, the way we would do this is we would break this down into its components. So we break it down into hundreds, we break it down into tens, and then we break it down into any units that we might have. So if you look at the number of 100s that we have, we only have one, 100. And we know that 100 is represented by a coil of rope. So we are looking at a single coil of rope. Then we look at the 50s. So we know that it takes five tens in order to make 50. And we know that one ten is represented as a heel bone. Therefore, we have five of those. So therefore, we are looking at one coil of rope and one, two, three, four, five heel bones, 3,200. So once again, we need to break this down into its core components. It's got three one thousands. It's got two one hundreds. And we don't have any tens or units. We know that a thousand is represented by the lotus flower we would need three of those. So there is a thousand, one thousand, and one thousand. So there's my three thousand represented. One hundreds is represented by a coil of rope and we have two one hundreds. So we would have two coils of rope. We then have a look at Sumerian Babylonian writing. Sumerians were doing mathematics as well as achieving many great things. For example, they invented the abacus, the wheel, and even agriculture. Various schools were associated with mathematics and the sciences. Sumerian Babylonian numbering system was predominantly a base 10, base 60 hybrid, and it evolved through many different periods in time. The Sumerians were amongst the first to invent tokens as a precursor to money, so this meant they could represent things from a real world as a token, and this could be stored and then counted again later on. But they were also into geometry, they were into geography, astronomy, mathematics, they were into commerce, and the civilization did turn into something very, very big. They could multiply, they could divide, they could do algebra, they could solve various different types of equations, uh, so linear and quadratic. And it's this numbering system that influenced the, how we, in our current day, actually tell time as there are 60 minutes in one hour and 60 seconds in one minute. So when we have a look at the numbering system itself, when we look at the one going up to the nine, these almost look like standard tallies. So it's the same symbol repeating itself just multiple times. So there's one of the symbol, then there's two of the same, then three of the same, four of the same, five of the same, six of the same, seven of the same, eight of the same symbol, and nine of the same symbol. When we get to the number 10, however, you notice how the symbol changes. 
But if we then look at the number 20, you'll see you have two of the 10 symbols. Remember that 10 plus 10 equals 20. If you look at the number 30, we have three of that same symbol again, because it's 10 plus 10 plus 10 equals 30. We can then use that marker in front of our tally marks. So when we now look at 11, we've got the 10th symbol, and then we have the ones symbol. If we then look at, for example, let's say 17, you've got the 10th symbol, and then you've got seven of the single marker symbols. So 10 plus 7 giving me 17. And this go carries all the way through to 59. So 59, obviously that's 5 tens, 9 tallies. So the Greeks were influenced by many nations, and this came through trade and conquest. The Greeks were, like many nations, extremely good at mathematics and had many of their own systems with regards to the sciences, astrology, and money as well. They were known to adopt ideas from other civilizations they came into contact with. The Greeks were a superpower at one point. They were conquerors. So, for example, Alexander the Great. And yes, they were one of the driving influences of many of the systems that we know of um, in the way of geometry and math and commerce. So the Greek numbering system has evolved over time from a linear-based Greek numerical system to Attic numbers. They then borrowed the Egyptian demotic writing system. This evolved via the Phoenician alphabet and produced Alexandrian numbers that had proper names. The interesting thing to note is that, as we discussed in a previous video on the alphabet, um, is that the Egyptians' w writing systems were a major influence uh, with regards to the Phoenicians and then the Phoenicians to the Greeks. So it's amazing how these systems get m passed on from one culture to another and then they get embellished on and modified. The Greeks were very big on proof. In other words, the old saying, prove it, um, they were into that sort of thing. So the Greeks were about the method in other words, how did we get to that specific conclusion or that specific answer? So there were a lot of Greek philosophers, uh, some very, very famous ones. Um, there were a lot of mathematicians that were trying to figure out the, the methods and the systems on how to get from point A to point B. So yes, they pioneered the proof, the systems behind those proofs. Pythagoras was known as a potential inventor of the proof and mathematics behind the right angle triangle, and he was Greek. But he was also responsible for asserting that numbers are part of the real world and therefore can be represented as such. So, for example, for the ability to be able to take music and to convert that into a number form was a classic example of Pythagorean thinking. So, when we look at the Attic numbering system, and specifically, we look at the units column, you'll notice that there's some similarities. So the number one, in effect, is what I will call an I. So in other words, it's a single tally. So if I wanted um, to represent four ones, what I would do is I would just have four of the single tally representing that one. So I would have one, 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 one. For example, that would be the number 4. If I wanted to represent a 5, then I would use what looks very much like a small letter R. A triangle would basically represent a 10, which meant that then your R in triangle would represent your 50. Because remember that your R is a 5 and your triangle is a 10. So 50, 10. The H symbol would represent 100, which meant that your R8 symbol would therefore represent 500. X represented 1000, RX represented 5000, M represented 10,000. So simply enough, still base 10, uh, because we are still counting in increments of 10. So for example, let's have a look at the number 42. There we are looking at four tens and two units. So we know that a 10 is a triangle. 
So there we are, we are looking at four triangles and we are then looking at two single tallies because that is two. So therefore we have four triangles and we have two tallies. Rome conquered Greece and took the alphabet and numbering system as well. Rome got on well with some of its neighbors but not so much with others and very often it was fear that would force other nations to comply with Rome because Rome got to the point where it was extremely powerful and so becoming somewhat of a superpower. Now this is obviously because through necessity as well the Romans would be thinking differently to the Greeks so they would be needing to fit these various different systems into their own ways of doing things. It's quite interesting because when you look at some aspects of the Roman Empire they actually devolved some technologies. So the way they saw numbers and the way they saw counting and the way they saw the world was a little bit different to the Greeks, which meant that um, there were certain technologies that were created by the Greeks that were actually reduced into older forms of technology. The interesting thing about numbering systems and mathematics is that the, the Romans didn't really invent anything groundbreaking. The Romans are really known more for things like their alphabets and for some of the technologies with regards to military and architectural technologies. So what this means is they were amazing engineers, but they didn't really make a lot of breakthroughs with regards to mathematics. And they were very strong in things like diplomacy and conquest. So when we look at the Roman numeral, this is something you might still see on things like watch faces and in certain calendars. But really it's more being fancy because this is a system that is not used at all. This numbers, numbering system was completely replaced by the Hindu Arabic systems. So what you're looking at here is actually extinct. You're looking at a dinosaur. Once again, when you look at your ones, that is your tallies, right? So if I want... Um, a 2, I would have 2 tallies. If I wanted 3, I would have 3 tallies. So that represented, in effect, your 1's column. We introduced the V, which is 5. Which means that if I have a 1 and then a V, that that is going to be 5 minus 1, which gives us 4. The same thing can be said when we have a look at the 6. What we have there is we have the V and the 1, which means that it is now 5 plus 1. So V1 means it's 5 plus 1. 1V one means it's 5 minus 1. Then we have VII, which obviously mean that's, means that that is 5 plus 1 plus 1. So that gives me 7. We have VIII, which means that that is 5 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 is 8. And then we have IX. So X means 10. IX equals 10 minus 1, which gives us 9. But you'll notice that we do still have your, your in-between characters. So let's have a look at 1024. We have additional symbols that we would look at after X. These are L, C, D, and N. L is represented by 50, C 100, D 500, and M, which is a thousand. So when we look at 1024, we break this down. So we have 1 of 1,000. So 1 of 1,000. And in our Tens and units columns, what we have is we have two tens, so we have two x's. So two tens, which are two x's, and then we have four units. So therefore, our final answer is m, because that is 1000. Then we have xx, and then we have iv. In Europe, this was then replaced in the 15th century by the Hindu Arabic system, giving rise to the numbers that we use today, which is why, apart from the occasional encounter with the Roman numeral, that system is basically extinct. This part of history is very, very fascinating, complex and extremely long, but definitely worthy 
of another video which will come later on this channel. And um, so we shall cover the transformation from the Hindu Arabic system to our specific numbering system in a future video. For those who are just a little bit confused to what I might be talking about, this is the Hindu numbering system over here. And this is uh, the numbering system that we are currently talking about over here. And you will see that some of the characters do look sort of similar. And um, for example, if I was to look at the number three, and the fact that we even have the zero comes from the Hindu Arabic system. It was through the Hindu Arabic system that they wrote the proof behind um, the concept of zero. You will notice that all the numbering systems we covered previously didn't have a zero in it. And this is because this was imported by these amazing people. We can conclude that numbering systems in mathematics can be extremely diverse with regards to nations, people and culture. Various people across many parts of the world added methods, systems, ideas, methodologies, knowledge and various different other ideas, providing us in turn with a useful tool that lets us view the world in the world of numbers. Thank you very much YouTube, I look forward to seeing you in the next video and have a fantastic day further.